Hello and welcome back to my channel. Thank you very much for joining me. Today's video is the second and final part in my coverage of the Rebecca Zahau case, at least for now. In my last video, I covered all the details about what happened to Ms. Zahau. During this video, my plan is to not rehash those details. Instead, I'm gonna focus on the legal battles that have been raging on two different fronts. And yes, I know that there are actually more than two court cases going on here, but I'm gonna focus on two of them for this video. The first one concerns a lawsuit that was brought against Adam Shacknai, his sister-in-law, Dina Shacknai, and Dina's twin sister, Nina Romano, which seeks to hold the defendants liable for how Rebecca Zahau's life came to an end. The second seeks to compel the San Diego Police Department to turn over all its records related to the investigation of the case. Of course, totally simplifying things here, but that's basically what the two cases are about. If this is the first video that you're watching, I highly suggest that you go back and watch part one. Before we get too far into this though, I want to remind you that I'm going to be at CrimeCon UK on June 11th and 12th in London at the Leonardo Royal Hotel and Spa near St. Paul's Cathedral. As I've said before, this is going to be my first time at CrimeCon. I'm a total newbie, but I'm really looking forward to it because there are a ton of guests that I personally really want to see, including Paul Holes, Carrie Danes, and many others. Podcast Row will be full of people I'm also looking forward to meeting for the first time in person, like Stephanie Harlow and Derek Lavasser, Emily G. Thompson from Mens Rea, and many others, including me. CrimeCon is the ultimate true crime weekend. It's partnered by CBS Reality, the expert-led true crime TV channel, uh, please join me there and use code GAVIN for 10% off admission. If you're a patron of mine, remember you get 15% off. Just DM me inside Patreon and I'll get you the hookup. For more information, visit crimecon.co.uk and thank you CrimeCon UK for providing that discount to my viewers and patrons. I can't wait to see some of you there. Really looking forward to it. Okay, it's November of 2013, and the Zahau family are about four months into a federal lawsuit that they filed against Adam Shacknai, Dina Shacknai, and Nina Romano. Remember, Dina is Adam's sister-in-law. Nina is Dina's twin sister. I covered, I covered this part in my last video. But that case is going to end up going on well into 2017. But... The main purpose, at least I think it was the main purpose, was for them to file a lawsuit before the statute of limitations expired on a wrongful death claim. In the state of California, that limit, that statute of limitations is two years. So while that U.S. case was in its infancy, Rebecca Zahau's family files another case, this time in California Superior Court. In the case they filed in the U.S. District Court, the Zahau family alleged four complaints. Number one, assault. Number two was battery. Number three was negligence. And number four was wrongful death. In the new case, they also allege four complaints, but they're slightly different. Number one, wrongful death. Number two, assault and battery. Number three, negligence. And number four is conversion. Which made me wonder, what is conversion under California law? I didn't know. It turns out that conversion is pretty much the civil equivalent of theft if it were in criminal court. So the Zahau family alleged that Adam, Dina, Nina, and up to 50 does or unknown persons wrongfully took something that belonged to the estate of Rebecca Zahau or could mean that they interfe interfered with the estate's ability to use something. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but at this point, I think 
I can see when somebody is doing some fancy lawyering. And I have to say, I do like and respect it when a lawyer does some fancy lawyering, whether it works in the favor of my side or not. Good lawyering is good lawyering. But is this good lawyering? I think to find out, we should read the text of the complaint. So let's go to page nine and read the fourth cause of action, which is the conversion cause of action. Quote, immediately prior to her, you know what, Rebecca owned the clothing she was wearing and also owned and possessed other personal property. By the performing the acts and or omissions set forth above, defendants in each of them intentionally and substantially interfered with Rebecca's personal property, taking possession and control of her clothing and took and or destroyed her other personal property according to proof prior carrying out the, you know what, sorry guys, of Rebecca. At no time during the events described in the preceding paragraphs above, nor at any time prior thereto, did Rebecca consent to any of the defendant's conduct, which resulted in the unlawful taking of her clothing and taking and or destruction of her personal property prior to her, you know what? As a result of defendant's intentional, reckless, wanton, and unlawful conduct, Rebecca's clothing was taken and personal property was taken and or destroyed. As a further result of defendant's actions, Rebecca is entitled to recover all damages that might have been recovered had she lived pursuant to California Code of Civil Procedure Section 377.34. In doing the acts here in alleged, defendants and each of them acted with oppression, fraud, and malice, and plaintiffs are entitled, entitled to punitive and exemplary damages in an amount to be proven at the time of trial. Close quote. Okay, so the allegation is that the parties liable for Rebecca Zahau's death and, and in their first complaint, Again, that was Adam Shacknai, Dina Shacknai, and her twin sister, Nina Romano. And yes, it will change in later amended complaints, which I'll get into. Anyway, the allegation is they stole her clothes and personal property and destroyed it all. Now, I personally think this is a good strategy. Again, I'm not a lawyer. But in a civil trial, you're trying to establish liability and you're seeking compensation. You're not going to get any imprisonment or anything like that. You're seeking compensation. So stacking more and more allegations onto your lawsuit, I think, is a good strategy. It is interesting to me, though, that by the end of the case, the Zahaus complaint is only going to list one defendant rather than 53 and will actually make three allegations instead of four. But let's keep reading the lawsuit. The prayer for, for relief is where I want to go next. By the way, guys, all of these records that I'm showing you are actually available for you to view on my website, which is gavinfish.com. You just click on cases, then Rebecca Zahau, and I'll leave a link in the description below, okay? All right, the prayer for relief says this. Number one, for compensatory damages according to proof. Number two, for special damages according to proof. Number three, for reimbursement of funeral expenses and costs of burial. Number four, for pecuniary damages according to proof. Number five, for personal property according to proof. Number six, for interest on all sums awarded according to proof. Number seven, for punitive and exemplary damages according to proof. Number eight, for costs of suit incurred herein. Number nine, all other relief which plaintiffs may be entitled under law. 
So these nine items are what the Zahao family were asking the court to award them should they win their suit. This reminds me, by the way, about a conversation that I had a couple of days ago uh, with the father of a victim of a suspected crime. He's been talking to me about his son's case. In that conversation, I asked him if he had planned on filing a civil lawsuit against his son's alleged attacker. He asked me if I thought he he should, you know, he asked me if I thought I should, even if the person didn't, he, even if the person he'd have to sue really didn't have anything that he could recover. And not to mention the fact that he really didn't want any money. He wanted his son back. Which actually takes me on another tangent. Remember the Princess Bride? When uh, the six-fingered man offered Inigo Montoya all that he wanted and Inigo replied, I want my father back, USOB. That's how families typically feel. They don't care about the money, but they want some sort of justice. They want the responsible person or people to pay. They want them to feel the pressure of responsibility, of, of guilt. And the rub in it, of course, is that they hardly ever do. When we get to the end of this lawsuit in the Rebecca Zahau case, I think the Zahau family probably discovers that winning isn't winning at all. But getting back to the question that was posed to me uh, by the man I was talking to of should he sue? And again, I'm not a lawyer, but I personally think families of victims should at least file a suit prior to the statute of limitations expiration. Even if it's still in the middle of the investigation or trial of the liable party, I think you should always file suit because there's so many cases I know about where the families are left without anything they can do when something just terrible happens to their loved ones. And you know what? From all the statutes I've read from states all around the country, the laws really are stacked in favor of the government if they drop the ball. I, I don't know, throw the case or through some kind of corruption or whatever. You know, if they drop the ball, they throw the case, they're corrupt, they, they do a cover up or say they just don't want to or aren't able to prosecute. If you want to hold them responsible for not fulfilling their obligations, whether it's the medical examiner, um, the prosecutor, the investigators, the police department, whatever, the bar is so high that you won't be able to overcome it. I mean, everything is stacked against you. And if you read around the internet about the lawsuits the Zahau family has filed, a big percentage of the comments are really disparaging toward the Zahau family, saying things like they're, they're wasting taxpayer money, they're wasting the court's time, stuff like that. And I think people who make comments like that really need to open their eyes to the abuses the victims' families have to suffer. And while I personally hate it when taxpayer dollars are wasted, I hate it much worse when the tax spenders protect the careers and cover up the misdeeds of the people who are employed by the public for the abuse of their power and their discretion. So I personally am extremely proud of the Zahau family for working so hard to bring justice to their daughter and sister and to bring the possible abuses of power into the light. Sunlight is the best disinfectant and California really needs some disinfecting. Okay, so we know th what the Zahows are alleging and what they want, but the defendants in this case, they come from a wealthy family and they're they not going to take this lying down. If you go onto the court's website and look at this case, there are over 55 pages of entries in the Register of Actions. I haven't counted it, but it's close to 1,100 documents filed in this case alone. Granted, many of these are media requests, but it's still a ton. And remember, while they're litigating this case, 
The Zahows are still fighting with Adam Shacknai, Dina Shacknai, and Nina Romano over in the U.S. District Court. If you go through the case dockets on both cases, while there's way more than you can actually see in the Superior Court, the strategy seems to be the same. Motion after motion, dismissals, demurs, answers to motions, answers to answers to motions, notices, stipulations. I mean, there are so many motions to strike filed in this case. It's just absolutely crazy. And along the way, the Zahau family wins the right to amend their complaint, which they do four times. Each amendment addresses something that's come up along the way in the lawsuit. From what I can tell, the differences, while I'm sure they're important to lawyers, they're actually very small. But the difference between the third and fourth amended complaints is actually huge. The fourth amended complaint was filed on February 28, 2018. The previous April, April 20th to be exact, the Zahau's lawyer, a guy named Keith Greer, held a press conference and he announced in that conference that Dina Shacknai and Nina Romano were being dropped as defendants in the lawsuit. The press release stated this, quote, Keith Greer Esquire said, when we filed the lawsuit, we relied on information which has now been refuted. After years of investigation and evidentiary analysis by experts, it has become evident that our initial theory, which alleged the involvement of Dina Shacknai and Nina Romano in the tragic death of Rebecca Zahau, was wrong. Through multiple sources, we have confirmed that Dina Shacknai was at Rady Children's Hospital in the PICU with her son, Maxie, throughout the evening of Rebecca's death, and specifically at the time a neighbor heard a woman that we allege was Rebecca screaming for help. The evidence also supports Nina Romano's statements that she was not in any way involved in Rebecca's death. Based on this evidence, we previously dismissed Nina Romano from the case and have now dismissed Dina Shacknai. We wish to apologize to Dina, Nina, and their families for the stress and trauma this process has had on their lives, particularly in light of the tremendous pain they continue to endure due to the loss of their beloved son, nephew, and grandchild, Maxie, said Greer. Although Nina and I do not agree with Keith Greer's litigation theory, we do agree that Max and Rebecca's deaths both need to be investigated further. It is shocking to us that this case was allowed to continue against us for almost four years in both state and federal court. My sister and I have suffered in every possible way, personally, professionally, and our overall health and well-being, and we still do not have answers, said Dina Shacknai. At today's press conference, the attorney for Nina Romano, Darren Wessel Esquire, said, In this case, Nina's insurance carrier made a business decision to end the financial bleeding from the cost of litigation and protect its insured Nina Romano. Her insurance carrier on its own negotiated this release. Nina Romano was always firmly and adamantly against paying any money to plaintiffs because she had nothing to do with Rebecca's death. As counsel confirmed, the unfortunate reality is that insurance companies do not have to follow their insured's wishes as happened in this case with Nina. A monetary settlement of any amount was absolutely against Nina's wishes. Close quote. So if I'm reading that right, Dina was dropped from the suit because it was proven to the satisfaction of the um, Zahau family and their attorney that she didn't have anything to do with Rebecca's death. Nina, however, was dropped because her insurance company 
negotiated a settlement of some kind and Nina made it clear through her lawyer that the settlement was against her wishes. Uh, the press release went on to say that Greer confirmed that his clients had not been offered millions of dollars to settle. So I think we can safely say that they settled for less than millions. What does that mean? I mean, less than two million? I don't know. But I suspect it was a lot. So Greer got busy and amended his client's complaint and filed it on February, February 28th, 2018. This is the complaint that ultimately goes to trial. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but you know what I mean. It goes to a jury, right? So at trial, it is a complete circus. Each side has expert witnesses that testify to the narrative that each side wants the jury to hear. I mean, they even had a mannequin that was the same size as Rebecca Zahau that they showed the jury in different positions, let's say. This trial made the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial look tame. And if you go and search on this case, like if you go Google it, there are thousands. I mean, there are endless stories about what happened in court on a particular day. I'm not going to get into those details. I'm just going to tell you that when the jury came back from deliberations, they found Adam Shackney was indeed responsible for what happened to Rebecca Zahau. It was interesting to me, though, that the verdict was not unanimous. But here's the thing. In a civil trial, it doesn't need to be unanimous. The plaintiffs don't have the same burden as the prosecution does in a criminal trial. They don't have to prove anything beyond a reasonable doubt. They just have well, they just have what is called the burden of persuasion, what we often hear stated as the preponderance of evidence. Basically, it means that if the plaintiff is able to show that a particular fact or event was more likely than not to have occurred, the jury needs to come back with a judgment in favor of the plaintiff. And that is exactly what happened in this case on February 6th, 2019. Now, in their prayer for relief, remember that the Zahau family asked for nine things. One, compensatory damages, according to proof. Two, special damages, according to proof. Three, reimbursement of funeral expenses and costs of burial. Four, pecuniary damages, according to proof. Five, for personal property, according to proof. Six, for interest on all sums awarded, according to proof. Seven, a big one, for punitive and exemplary damages, according to proof. Eight, for costs of the suit incurred. And nine, all other relief which plaintiffs may be entitled to under law. When the jury totaled it all up, they came back with an award of $5.1 million to the Zahau family. Of course, Adam Shack and I then had the right to appeal, which probably would have taken years. Remember that by this time, they'd been fighting for five years and almost three months. So the following week, the Zahau family agreed to a settlement of $600,000 if Adam Shackney waived his right to appeal, which was paid by Adam Shackney's insurance carrier, from what I understand. And that, my friend, is the end of this story. Now, I'm just kidding. It's not even close to the end. There's still the matter of the sheriff and this. This is the part where it gets really interesting for me because it's where we begin to see what I think is evidence of a cover-up. So let's get some background on this legal battle, starting with a brief timeline, okay? Adam Shackney was found liable for what happened to Rebecca Zahau on April 4th, 2018. 
At that time, San Diego Sheriff Bill Gore was running for re-election against a man named Dave Myers, who was the San Diego Sheriff's commander. Myers had said publicly that if he were to get elected, he would reopen the Rebecca Zahau investigation. Both of these things, Adam Shacknai being found liable and his opponent, his opponent saying he'd reopen the case, put enormous pressure on Sheriff Gore. So on April 16th, he announced that the department would take another look at the evidence. The Zahau's complaint pointed out that when Sheriff Gore made that announcement, he said that, quote, the review conveniently would not be concluded until after the election, quote, close quote. That's a quote from the complaint, not from the sheriff. Sure enough, though, Sheriff Gore defeated Commander Myers in the primary and was elected on November 6th, 2018. On December 7th, the sheriff's office issued a press release stating, quote, after conducting a thorough review of the case, the review team found no evidence indicating that Rebecca Zahau died at the hands of another. In addition, the team found no evidence that would dispute or be inconsistent with the medical examiner's findings, close quote. Maybe I'm a cynic, but the timing of all of this, as my eight-year-old would say, is sus. I mean, you're pretty good at being opaque about the case, Sheriff Gore. Can you at least try not to be transparently corrupt about the investigation review? In looking through the comments on my last video about this case, one of my viewers said that they wouldn't be surprised if the Shack Nyes were donors to Sheriff Gore's re-election campaign. And I wouldn't be surprised either. I found the website where all of those donations are disclosed, but there are so many layers of PACs and campaign committees. It would honestly be a full-time job to find out. And the Shack Nyes are wealthy people who I'm sure have learned to manage their donations very well. So I'm not going to keep digging on that. Let me just say once again that I would not be surprised in the least if it were true. Now, getting back to the lawsuit and the timeline, on January 25th of 2019, about a month and a half later, Adam Shackney's legal team filed a motion to have the jury's verdict set aside for lack of evidence. This was a bad move because the judge issued a scathing tentative ruling. You can read the whole thing on my website, gavinfish.com, the link is below. But in it, Judge Catherine Bacall wrote about the strong evidence supporting the verdict the jury came down with. And I'm going to read what she had to say. Quote, the court feels remiss if it does not state that the sheriff's investigation leaves almost as many questions unanswered as it answered. For example, when a cryptic message written in third person is painted on a door near where a young woman is, you know what it, common sense and every mystery novel teaches that the message has a meaning. The sheriff's investigation apparently could not determine the meaning of the message and thus gave it no weight. However, the evidence showed that Rebecca wrote extensively about herself in the first person. She was a painter who was comfortable painting letters as well as figures. Given these facts alone, common sense says Rebecca did not paint the amateurishly painted message on the door. And if she did not, someone else did. Determining who wrote the message would certainly be circumstantial evidence pointing to who you know what it Rebecca Zahau. This was only one of numerous pieces of circumstantial evidence that puts the sheriff's conclusion into question. As a result, it is not unreasonable to still ask who you know what it, Rebecca Zahau, close quote. 
So about a week later, on March 2nd, the Zahao family sent in a California Public Records Act, uh, Act request to the San Diego Sheriff's Department asking for records of the investigation. They wanted pretty much everything, and I have some experience with this. I have experience specifically with the California Public Records Act. This act, in my opinion, is probably the second worst public records act in the nation. It has so many exemptions written into the law that in my opinion, for the most part, the person seeking the records is at the mercy of the department they're requesting the records from. And this is especially true when it comes to law enforcement investigation records. They never want those to be public. I mean, never. One of the exemptions of the law is records of an, of an active investigation. Knowing this, law enforcement departments all over the Golden State keep investigations open on purpose. For example, officially, Rebecca Zahao was unalived per se. That's a fancy Latin phrase that means by oneself, right? And in the state of California, that act is not a crime. Therefore, any records of the investigations would be records of a non-crime, making it not an open criminal case. But what law enforcement does to make sure nobody scrutinizes their work is they keep the case open as if it were a criminal case. And they justify this by saying, well, it's possible that we might get some new information sometime in the future that changes our mind. It could become a crime, so we're keeping the case open. And in California, there's no expiration on non-public documents like there is in other states. Minnesota, for example, makes all non-public records public after 30 years, but not so in California and many other states. This is something that needs to change. So the House put in their CPRA request and received a response from the department on March 12th, stating that the records, not surprisingly, were exempt from public disclosure. The next day, the House sent in a new request asking Sheriff Gore why he didn't get Adam Shackney's cell phone records, but got several others. On the 26th, the department responded in a letter stating that the records they sought were, you guessed it, exempt from public disclosure. What's crazy about this is that you can go to the San Diego Sheriff's website and see all sorts of publicly disclosed documents about this case, many of which are exempt from public disclosure, but the sheriff disclosed them anyway. So this tells us that the sheriff apparently has uh, discretion on, on whether or not he, in this case, will release uh, non-public documents, documents that are exempt from public disclosure. Everything the sheriff released, by the way, supported the conclusion of per se. The Zahao family wants access to all the records as they are entitled under the CPRA. So they filed a suit to get rid of mandate, ordering the sheriff to provide the records they requested. They also asked to recover attorney's fees and any, quote, such further relief as this court deems just and proper, close quote. Now in this case, like in the other one, it is chock full of motions and responses, but it seems to me that the tool the sheriff's department has decided to use in its defense is what is called a demurrer. A demurrer is an objection that basically says what the petitioners are saying is true and factual, but their point is irrelevant. The content that the, uh, let's see, the content in the files that they seek are in fact exempt by law. That, that's kind of what the demurrer is. So in response, the Zahao family filed yet another amended complaint, and this one 
was a whopping 153 pages long. Again, it's available on my website. There's a link below. In it, they include pages and pages of exhibits from the Adam Shackney trial, as well as the actual letters requesting documents. And one of the things that's interesting to me is that one of the requesters, a man, a man named Doug Laner, I think, or Loner, who is Rebecca Zahau's sister's husband, he's a retired detective, albeit from another state to the best of my knowledge. His letter to the custodian records, the custodian of records, is a case study in how to write the perfect request. I mean, it's perfect. He obviously knows what he's doing. I suspect that beyond just not wanting their records out, the sheriff's department especially didn't want to give them to a retired detective. It's like when the Philadelphia PD allowed Ellen Greenberg's parents to take a look at their files about their daughter's case, but absolutely would not let Tom Brennan, a retired detective, in with them to see them. I think it's like that. Anyway, the case is going back and forth, as all cases do, when the Zahau side makes an argument that Sheriff Gore's instructions to his review team the, the team who reviewed the case after his re-election is not exempted under the CPRA. Therefore, they want those records and they want to depose Sheriff Gore, who is by this time retired. And holy cow, did that not sit well with the sheriff's department. They swiftly filed a motion for a protective order, which would essentially shield... Sheriff Gore from deposition. Of course, the Zahau side responded, and they responded with a nine-page opposition to the motion, but the judge issued a tentative ruling in favor of the sheriff's office. The ruling granted a protection order of Sheriff Gore as well as what's known as the PMK, or the person most knowledgeable. Basically, it says that the Zahaus can't go around the corner and find somebody else to depose. They can't do that. That order was handed down on March 25th, 2022, just a couple of months ago. And in that order, they also handed down a slap on the wrist to the Zahau's attorney for not showing up to a hearing. I think that's just kind of a sideshow. I'm not going to go over it, mostly because it just doesn't interest me and it's already resolved. But that brings us up to date. The next time the Zahaus will be in court is scheduled for July, um, where the two sides will argue about the merits of the case itself. And it's funny to me that two years into this thing, they've yet to argue the merits. Now, you might be asking where I stand on this case. I think I've given you a pretty good sense of where I am. But let me just say a couple of things as I kind of wrap up the video. I send in a lot of public records requests as part of what I do here on my channel. I've sent in well over probably six or 700 requests to jurisdictions all over the country. Many of those requests were for cases you've seen on this channel. Um, some of them are for cases that I'll make videos about in the future. And some of them are for clients who've hired me to try to get them information on a case that they're working on. Usually it's because something terrible has happened to one of their loved ones and I've been able to obtain, I don't know, close to 10,000 pages of public records as I've been doing this. But I think that number probably pales in comparison to the number of pages that I've been denied access to. And those denials are made really only for a few reasons. Each state has its own laws regarding disclosure of records, and this might be kind of a tangent, but real quick, FOIA only covers the federal government. And I hate it when people say they send in a FOIA request, when they mean to say they send in a public records request covered by a law in their state, and it's called something different in every state. It Guys, it's like nails on a chalkboard to me. <laughs> I guess what I'm getting at 
though, is that there isn't a uniform law that covers every jurisdiction in every state of the USA. Public records laws are as many as they are varied. Uh, I would never propose that there be a uniform law that covers all the states because that would take power away from the citizens of those states. But there are a couple of things that I think should be written into every public records law in the United States. For me, number one is there should be an expiration of non-public records. I think 20 years is the max. Like I said before, states like California do not have expiration dates on their non-public records. That means cases like Judy Hawkery's from 1970 will likely never be solved even though the perpetrator or perpetrators have likely already passed away. I think there needs to be an expiration date, okay? Number two, in the case of records from law enforcement agencies, I think once a case is closed, it should be 100% public. And I think all cases should automatically close no later than five years after the crime. I think the statute of limitations for civil suits, like wrongful death suits, should also be two years after the records are made public, not two years after the crime occurred. And I think if every state of the nation would adopt these two suggestions, citizen detectives and internet sleuths all over the world would likely help to solve thousands of cases every year. And I honestly believe that. If you watched part one of this case, you'll know that I decided to take a look at it because a viewer named Jenna reached out to me on my website. This is the message that, um, or this is what Jenna's message said to me, quote, you are so great at getting into documents. One case that has always been interesting to me is the Rebecca Zahau case. There's been a lot of lawyering going on and it seems complicated. I'd love to hear you explain what's going on before the next court date in July, if possible. Close quote. So, Jenna, I hope I've explained what's going on, at least to your satisfaction. I know the word tragic is overused in our little corner of the internet, but this is truly a tragic case. It's tragic because of what happened to Rebecca Zahau. It's also tragic because of what the Zahau family had to go through in order to get some amount of justice. And it's tragic because the public records laws in California shield officials like Sheriff Bill Gore from releasing documents to the, uh, that the public should have a right to. I hope that the Zahows prevail in their lawsuit against Sheriff Gore. I think it's probably a steep climb. Everything is against them. But if anybody has the grit to get it done, I think they do. In the coming weeks, I'm gonna, well, I'm hoping to bring you a couple of updates to some cases I'm watching. I have another couple of cases that I've been working on that are waiting in the wings. <laughs> so please subscribe to my channel if you like this kind of content. And if you liked this video, please click the thumbs up button below. If you didn't like it, click thumbs down so I know and please share this video with everything you know who you think will like it. Uh, please also remember, last thing, to claim your 10% discount to CrimeCon UK if you're going to be in London on July 11th or 12th. And remember that if you're a Patreon supporter of mine, you get 15% off admission. I did the math. And if you're not a supporter of mine and you are going to CrimeCon in UK, that basically gets you 15 months of being my Patreon supporter. <laughs> so there's that. And um, I really hope to see you there. Okay, with that, I will bid you adieu. And I hope to see you next time. Take care. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe to my channel. And if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below.